It's 1999, and the original driver is a massive sleeper hit, outselling every other PS1 game by the end of the year, a year which also saw Gran Turismo 2, Final Fantasy VIII, Crash Team Racing, Spyro 2, and Tony Hawk's Pro Skater release on the PlayStation. Instantly, and against all odds, Driver was huge, and it's only natural that a sequel was put in the works. The hype train had immediately left the station, and it didn't look like slowing down, and the publisher Atari, or Infogrames at the time, really went for it with their marketing. Live action trailers to look like movie trailers, promotional over the top merch like cigars, and multiple stylish magazine covers with articles that promised how everything was going to be bigger and better, and how you can now get out of your car and steal other cars. This was pre-GTA 3, so this was a big deal, and though the game was only ever slated for the PlayStation, press speculation and magazine misprints had people looking forward to a Dreamcast, a PS2, a Mac, and even a Game Boy Color version of the game, none of which ever came out. Regardless, the world was excited for another Driver, and fans wouldn't have to wait long. Less than 17 months after the first game's release, Driver 2 confidently hit store shelves in November of 2000, with Infogrames shipping a million units to the United States alone. It was a guaranteed hit after all, but it wasn't exactly smooth sailing critically, or smooth driving rather. It's, it's easy to forget because of what happened with Driver 3, but Driver 2 was, and still still is, in a lot of people's eyes, the disappointing Driver sequel. Critics, while acknowledging some improvements, universally panned the game's poor frame rate and graphical downgrade, neither of which can be argued against because Driver 2 is a bit of a technical disaster. The draw distance is so poor that entire buildings will appear right in front of you, and many visual effects have been simplified or removed entirely, but really it's the frame rate that drags Driver 2 down most. It's, it's just doing far too much for the PS1, and it genuinely feels like you're playing the game in slow motion. I, I, I know that sounds like hyperbole, but it sadly isn't. Of course, it's been 20 years, and with emulation we can overclock a PS1's virtual CPU, and thankfully Driver 2 scales perfectly without any glitches when you do. Uh, though we can't fix the draw distance or the visual downgrades, we can consistently hit the 30 frames per second target, and after being so used to the slow-mo, fixing it was like wearing glasses for the first time. It, it was gloriously smooth, but honestly it was also a bit disorienting. Like, at full speed I have less time to react to things, and being so familiar with Driver 2, it actually took some time to get used to, which speaks to just how slowly it runs natively. At first I wanted to make this review without fixing the frame rate because it means something to me to show the genuine, unaltered original version of the game, but after playing a few missions I just had to fix it for my own enjoyment's sake. Uh, without the frame rate fix, Driver 2 to me is easily the worst mainline driver game, and, and, and this can be attributed to such a rushed development. Infogrames forced reflections to make the entire game in that short year and a bit, which wasn't long enough for what such an ambitious project warranted, and though it is a still good game even with the poor frame rate, it's from Frustrating that this is what happened, and even more frustrating that it was only ever released on the PS1 when every other mainline driver game at least came out on the PC. So with all that in mind, there's actually a lot to love about Driver 2. The fantastic weighty car handling with Hollywood tail out drifting returns alongside an improved replay editor and a wonderful movie loving energy. Just sliding around these streets and crashing into things is fun, and where cities were only ever grids in the first game, they're now far more geometrically complex with curved roads and overpasses and tunnels, making for a much more dynamic experience. Uh, before you had to get really good at swinging around right angle turns, now you have to be able to keep your composure around long bends or inclines and declines, and I know it sounds primitive and simple, but with such a demanding and addictive driving physics engine, it's genuinely fun trying to master these streets. There's also now a much wider array of vehicles with some bigger buses and trucks too, where they've done a fantastic job at making the weightier vehicles punch through the lighter ones. It's fun parting the seas with a truck, and because this is driver, you can drift basically everything from buses to limos, and I'm here for it. And of course, you can now walk the streets and steal cars, a mechanic that's used sparingly in the story mode for the occasional car swap or button press. Uh, you can't get out of your car while you're being chased, there's no shooting or jumping or anything, and in missions you usually just don't have enough time to get out, so it's rare that you will, but in the free roam mode getting out is a huge addition just because you can muck around more and leave your vehicle behind if it's totaled. The one aspect of the original Driver that most obviously needed improving was the cutscenes, and boy does Driver 2 deliver. Where they were awkward, ugly, brief, and near inaudible, they're now very stylishly directed and easier to follow. And don't get me wrong, they're still very 90s jank and the voice acting isn't up to scratch, but man do they add a lot of good flavour with their tough guy cast and well-integrated songs. The opening cutscene at the Red River Bar 
see what they did there, will always be etched into the back of my mind where we're introduced to the trench coat wearing, sawn off wielding series bad guy, Jericho, who shoots that sawn off far too many times without reloading. We're also introduced to a character named Pink Lenny, the guy Jericho was sent to kill in this cutscene. Uh, Pink Lenny is Driver 2's MacGuffin. He's a money launderer who, to oversimplify things, betrayed an American gang to help a Brazilian gang. You spend the game chasing him down to stop a war from breaking out between the two gangs. You might be wondering why Lenny is so important. Like, why does finding him stop a war from breaking out? Well, that's kind of the big question mark throughout the game, but you'd be forgiven for thinking that you should know and you just maybe miss something. Uh, every cutscene is brief and each one usually introduces an important plot point or a twist, so it's a bit blink and you miss it. Something the game doesn't introduce are these characters. You're basically thrown into the mix of things and left to figure everything out. And if you're not keeping track of names from the very start, you can easily get lost. It's not super complicated or anything, and again, it's far more followable than the first game, it's just told very suddenly and quickly. These cutscenes are the reason the game is now split across two discs, with the story split in half. Opening in Chicago, the first mission isn't another garage test like you might expect, it's actually just a nonchalant driving across the map mission, and whether you played the first game or not, you'll be surprised by just how big these maps are, while still having distinct areas and landmarks. It's all familiar, fun stuff. You're chasing cars, you're getting chased by cars, there's easy tailing missions, and you're avoiding and escaping the police. Uh, there are more set PC missions sliced in every now and then though, like with the third mission which has you chasing a train, which is an obvious homage to the 1972 film The French Connection, which though set in New York has a famous chase scene that's very similar to this. They even bash through a pile of boxes in the film. The French Connection is also well known for establishing the buddy cop trope, which is something Driver 2 introduces to the mix with Tanner's new partner, Tobias Jones, a slightly more level-headed counterpart who, like Jericho, would go on to become a staple character in the series. All the characters in this game are one-dimensional archetypes, but with Driver 2 being another pulpy Hollywood throwback, I guess that's kind of the point. At one point, Tanner gets captured by the American gang, headed by an eccentric bald man named Kane, who, I mean, just... Look at him, and we're treated to Jericho's first line of dialogue in the series. Jericho? It's okay. I'm gonna shoot you in the head. Everything Jericho says in this game is hysterical. Uh, Tanner escapes and we're treated to another more scripted set piece style mission which has you driving out of an industrial area through a bunch of warehouses while enemies are trying to block your path at every other corner. Uh, you really have to think on your feet to get through this mission and it keeps escalating as you make it onto the street but trucks are blocking your way until eventually you must jump over a drawbridge to escape. I beat it with less than a second to spare and it was thrilling, and this sort of mission is when Driver 2 is at its finest, where you're being hunted and you need to make split second decisions to survive. By the time you've completed the Chicago missions, you'll have picked up on how this game is quite a bit more difficult than even the first Driver, which was itself infuriating at times. Uh, there's one mission in particular called Chase the Intruder, where you have to drive near perfectly to beat it, and even then you'll need some luck on your side. Like, I'd wager that this is where a lot of people gave up on the story mode, because man, it takes some perseverance. Uh, at least most people made it past the first mission this time, though. But Chase the Intruder is nothing compared to what's to come. Lenny flies to Havana to help the Brazilian gang, hence the cigar, so of course Tanner flies over to find him. Driver's gone global. Let me introduce you to a seemingly standard mission in the tight streets of Havana called Hijack the Truck. Uh, the idea is, you gotta crash into this truck enough times that it stops so that you can steal it, all the while you're being chased by its escort. Now, this escort car is savage, like, it's way faster than you and it'll slam you into every wall, tree, pole and car that it can can, and there's little that you can do to avoid it. But if you do manage to, the truck itself is an even bigger problem. If it turns right at the first intersection, just restart the mission. You have no hope of ever catching him, even if you do make it around the corner without being completely pummeled. Uh, if it doesn't turn though, you're tasked with taking down a truck with unrealistic acceleration and infinite mass. No matter how hard you crash into them, they're going to continue happily on their trajectory without acknowledging your existence, and you're going to bounce off them, likely ruining your entire run. Their path isn't completely scripted and predictable like in the later GTA games, Games, and if it was, you could cut them off a lot easier, but it's not, so it's just that bit more frustrating. It's contentious, but I believe that this mission is the most difficult in Driver 2, and it's the most difficult in the entire Driver series, which says a lot considering how hard these games can be. It's even worse than the final President's Run mission in the original game, and that level was thrown in as an ultra-hard finale, but we're not even halfway through Driver 2 yet. The first game always teetered on being too hard, or should I say too unfair, like, it's a balance 
balance where you've got to make the odds a bit against you so that when you do beat a level it feels like a gratifying achievement where you're overcoming something, but in Driver 2, in this mission, forget any semblance of balance. It's completely tipped in the frustrating and unfair direction and you'd be forgiven for using save states here. It wouldn't be so bad if Driver 2 didn't keep tipping over that balance. Every single time one of these infinite mass chase missions appears, it's an absolute roadblock to the pace of the game, no pun intended, and there's a decent amount of them. Uh, virtually every other mission that doesn't involve an infinite mass chase is challenging but well balanced or even a bit too easy, so the difficulty curve is mostly flat with just random spikes everywhere. Towards the end of the Havana missions, Tanner captures Jericho in another unfair chase mission and we're treated to this game's most iconic line of dialogue because it's also the first thing you hear in the startup video when you turn on your PlayStation. Of course, it's by Jericho. Kane's in Vegas. He already knows Vasquez is coming for him, doesn't he? Well, you and me are gonna pay Kane a visit. I'm gonna pop your neck with my hands. If you're a fan of this game, don't tell me that that line isn't etched into your brain. Uh, sure enough, you pay mob boss Kane a visit in Vegas by switching to disc 2, where you go undercover for him to find Lenny. Uh, it's really hard to believe that these seasoned gangsters can't tell that Tanner and Jones are cops, especially when gangsters apparently dress like this in the world of Driver. Thank God Vegas is in this game. Like, after the tight streets of Chicago and Havana, and after all those ultra difficult missions in those tight streets, we're treated to massively wide roads and big gaps in between buildings. Buildings. Frankly, it's a huge relief to drift around these forgiving streets at this point in the game. Even the infinite mass missions aren't nearly as bad here because driving here is just so graceful. I really do think that Vegas is quite an underrated and underappreciated city in the series. Like, beyond the stress-free roads, it's, it's very diverse with suburban areas and deserty areas and big highways outside of the main strip. Uh, all the maps are really impressive in terms of scale and detail, and Vegas is no exception, being the most unique of them all. Finally, Lenny bails to Rio, so everyone else follows. Uh, Rio mixes Vegas's wideness and Havana and Chicago's tight streets, which is fitting as it's the final city. Really, these Disc 2 cities are far more diverse and fun to drive in than the Disc 1 cities, so after the game beats you down in Havana, it wins you back in Vegas and Rio, or maybe I'd just have Stockholm Syndrome. Rio Helms, another mission that I've heard people describe as Driver 2's hardest mission called Chase the Gunman. Uh, it's just like any other infinite mass chase mission, of course, it's only even harder, really. I, I still personally think that Hijack the Truck is worse just because it also has someone chasing you, but this mission is certainly very close. Uh, that said, I actually really like how you chase along the edge of this cliffside here. It, it feels right out of a Bond film. Fun fact, Jones was originally meant to die here, and rather than the mission being called Chase the Gunman, it was meant to be named Chase Jones. Jones's killer. The cutscene makes him look dead at first and in some shots, but by the end he's alive and on his knees. Series creator Martin Edmondson notes, Jones seemed to have been a success, which resulted in him being resurrected at the 11th hour, which explains why the cutscene is so choppy. My favourite mission in Rio has you driving across the map to get on this barge, avoiding police along the way. Uh, once you're on it you have to hop out, plant explosives on foot, then hop back in your car and jump off the barge as it pulls away from the dock, and it feels as cool as it sounds. The on-foot stuff, though it controls very awkwardly, is occasionally used quite cleverly like this. Uh, some missions start with you on foot and give you options for which vehicle you want to take, which is great, but again the on-foot stuff is sparse and it could easily not be in the story mode at all. Uh, another thing I love about how missions start in this game is that they often seem to aim your car in the wrong direction, which sounds terrible on paper, but it just means that you have to whip your car around every time you restart and honestly I'm all here for it. Like, it feels great and it captures that urgent Hollywood feeling by making you do that 180 and floor it maneuver that they all do. Finally, you capture your pink Lenny after chasing a helicopter of all things, like why doesn't it just fly up? Uh, Tanner says he doesn't even care about what Pink Lenny knows in his triumphant speech, which is annoying because I want to know, but then it's revealed that the Brazilian and American gangs were working together this whole time, indicating that the whole Pink Lenny thing was a ruse. They were both just using him, and they both just wanted to get rid of him. It's not a bad twist, and it sort of explains why we're chasing Lenny, but as the game keeps throwing twists and turns at you throughout, you're pretty numb to it by this point, and it's, it's barely hinted towards if at all, so uh, it, it doesn't really land. Credits roll and we wrap up Driver 2. Uh, what's so interesting is how Driver 2 picks out elements of the first game and just stretches them to an extreme. Uh, it takes the chase missions and makes them ten times worse, and it takes the technical issues and makes them ten times worse, but 
then on the other hand it takes the cities and the vehicle selection and the cutscenes and makes them ten times better. It's a game that's filled with higher highs and lower lows. So the question then becomes, as a whole, is Driver 2 better or worse than Driver 1? Well, as you might have guessed, it mostly depends on what you value. With the cities and cars being so much better, the bonus side games and especially the free roam modes are much better too. Particularly now that you can get out of your car. Like, back in the day, free roam mode was so much fun in Driver 2, and there's still fun in getting police chases and finding the secret cars, which are awesome by the way. Like, I love how they're hidden. Like, the one in the baseball stadium where you gotta use that ticket booth to open the gates, or or the one in Havana, which is a mini in an underground base that gets elevated to the ground. It's cool stuff. And there's also a split screen multiplayer mode that's unfortunately very half baked. It's only two player and you can only drive around in the bumper view and there's no traffic on the roads. It, it, it just feels very stripped back just so that it can actually like run on the console. Of course, mucking around in the free roam mode doesn't quite have the same appeal almost 20 years later and 20,000 open world games later. And though this shouldn't be judged by today's standards, the reason you'd really be going back to Driver 2, if not for a quick nostalgia hit, is for that story mode. If you can put up with some frustrations and value more production value, gameplay variety and storytelling, then maybe Driver 2 would be your choice, but I personally just can't get past those ultra unfair chase missions. Fix those and Driver 2 beats the original for me. And while you're at it, please fix that frame rate and draw distance. Before closing, it's worth reiterating that the core of Driver is still here. Like as frustrated as I am that it didn't fully reach its potential, Driver 2 is still a great game, and it's still one of my favourite PS1 games, flaws and all. The cars, the cities, the vibe, it, it, it's just a game that sort of has it, you know? Like, if you want to lose yourself to a video game version of a 70s or 80s cop movie with some old school PS1 graphics, then Driver 2 is the imperfect game for you. Driver 2 sold almost 3 million copies, close to as many as the original, and it's very fondly remembered by fans to this day. Uh, series creator Martin Edmondson has since acknowledged and agreed that this game would have been far better had it been made for the PS2, and that it suffered from too tight a development time. Bizarrely, the only port, if you can even call it that, that we ever saw of Driver 2 was to the Game Boy Advance, which I've briefly talked about a few times on the channel before for its technical achievements. It only featured Chicago and Rio, but it was a surprisingly decent port of the game that still told the same story. Uh, perhaps it's a topic for a follow-up video. Though Driver 2 never made it to the PS2, we would see not one but two Driver games come out for the PlayStation successor. Driver 3 in 2004, which is a can of worms in so many different ways, and Driver Parallel Lines in 2006, a game which changes the direction of the series. But first, Reflections diverted their attention to a new game, another skill-based driving game, 2002's Stuntman. Uh, stay tuned for a deep dive into Stuntman and the following Driver games. Thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this retrospective of Driver 2. Before I do my Patreon readouts, I want to thank the Driver Madness fan community, and specifically a user and internet friend of mine named uh, Vortex Story, who's a YouTuber who covers Driver content, and he, he's, he's the biggest Driver nerd I know, and um, he, he helped out a lot with the research for this video and provided some footage, and I'm very thankful for that. And I also want to shout out my Driver Game Boy Color video, which I did because I wanted to get more views because I'm selfish. Um, but yeah, Driver GBC was a really sort of impressive Game Boy Color game. Like it was fully open world with police AI and um, it's worth checking out. And uh, I want to thank uh, Fan2Driver on Instagram for providing the c cigars image. Thank you for that. And um, now I want to thank my patrons. Uh, Patreon's a great way you can support the channel if you want to support the channel financially. If you don't, feel free to just like and subscribe and comment and all that sort of stuff. That helps as well. But I want to thank all my patrons, including the ones coming up on the screen, and specifically including Adam Beals, Analog Man, Anthony Heisel, BC's Gaming Shelf, Blake Barnett, Boggy Online, Caden the Dingo, Chris Bushkus, Devin Grandal, Dominic Chikoki, Gary Pay, James Lock the Large, James Lock the Large, Casey, Kayla, Labcat, Lachlan Jones, Lucas Raysevic, Maximilian Kunzman, May Arise, Mazaki, Melanie G, Minimi's Thumbnails, Spark Joy, Mustache Duct Tape, Mrs. Minimi, Peaceful Kumquat, Plague, Riddlin for Kids, Skyed Panthera, Tio, Test Drive Unlimited 2, The Mighty Mega Link, Thomas Damsgaard, Trap Law Ross, Travis, Trevor Corbin, Trixie Emerson, Under 10 Hours, Who Walks with Fergus, Writing on Games, and Zindictive. Thank you all for supporting. Uh, thank you all for watching. Hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you all in the next video. Take it easy.